We got a great panel that's up ahead here and great voices uh, from the PE side as well as the asset management side. I'm pleased to bring in Sheila Patel, chairwoman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and Jean-Eric Salata from uh, Bearings Private Equity Asia, the chief executive and founding partner. Uh, Sheila Patel, I was going to just kick, kick off with your bios real quick. Uh, she has leveraged her knowledge of portfolio solutions, sustainable finance, uh, emerging growth themes, governance, and other key long-term trends to advise clients. She also oversees uh, Goldman's asset management, ESG, and impact investment initiatives. She joined Goldman Sachs in 2003 as a managing director and was named partner in 2006. Jean, uh, over at from Bearings, was responsible for the investment activity of the firm since 1997 when he started the regional Asian private equity investment program for UK-based bearing private equity partners. He later led the management buyout of that program in 2000 and established Bearing Asia as an independent firm. So thank you so much for joining us, Sheila and John. Thank you. And let's, let's kick it off here because we, we were talking about a survey just now that we were asking the audience about where we are in this economic recovery. It's obviously been a tough couple of months. The situation is still very fluid. There's fears of a second wave as a lot of these economies do emerge out of this crisis. Where, where are we now? Sheila, I'll, I'll bring the first question to you. Thanks. Well, it's great to be here. And look, I think we are in the middle of the game, nowhere near the end of the game in terms of this crisis. I think people have looked for V-shaped recoveries and what we see is a series of recoveries, smaller Vs by sector, by region, a lot of concern as you mentioned about second waves. So we have, we have a long way to go before we're on solid footing and I think you'll see market volatility due to that. And John, tell us what's going on inside your portfolio companies right now in, in Asia. Which industries are, are faring better? Which are, you think, can actually excel in the future coming out of this crisis? Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, it's it's been a, uh, a, a very uh, brutal dislocation that we've been through uh, in the last few months, and it's affected just about every company in every sector. But we are starting to see some signs of recovery in some sectors and in some markets. I think China was the first to go into the crisis and is the first that we see coming out of the crisis. Many of our companies that we've invested in in China are already operating at nearly full utilization, in some cases up 5 or 10% year on year. Um, I think we're all cautious about what's going to happen when the impact of the declining demand in Europe and external demand in the U.S. hits the export sector of the Chinese economy. But we are starting to see some positive signs of a bottoming, at least in other markets as well, and the beginnings of recovery. Uh, I think we're sort of managing our portfolio on a week to week, month to month basis, working with our companies, keeping the communication line open, and making sure that we're responding to changes in the market conditions as quickly as we can. But there have been some, some changes and some effects from the crisis that I think will be long lasting and permanent, some negative sure. and some positive. Uh, you know, on the positive side, what a crisis like this enables you to do is to really use the crisis as a catalyst for making some of the tough decisions that were more difficult to make in an organization during normal times. So some of the structural changes, the cost changes, even the business model changes that we're seeing um, may, be, uh, may be beneficial in the long term uh, and may be permanent as a result of this crisis that we've had to live through. So overall, I think... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we'll get to the examples a little bit later. I, I, there's a lot of questions streaming through here now, Sheila, uh, on just what's going on in the markets right now, right? We've seen this tremendous rally since March. Central banks, uh, as one viewer asking, have they actually created a floor for asset prices? Is there now no argument for bearish positions? I don't think I'd say there's no argument for bearish positions, but certainly central banks around the world have showed a willingness to uh, stop any declines and, and to be supportive in this difficult environment uh, well beyond what we saw in the financial crisis, and they continue to step in. So I think you know the, the question remains as to is, is there an endpoint, and most importantly, how do they roll back? 
uh, some of this support. But I also think that there are investors interested in important uh, opportunities. For example, you know, I had many global investors say uh, the central banks almost were too quick on the credit front and it shut them out of potentially some opportunities. Now, I think there'll, there'll be plenty ahead and there's plenty of challenge that will create these, uh, these chances. But, you know, we saw both large institutions and of late retail very supportive uh, in the markets. So, so the buyers are there and they see long-term value. So, Sheila, do you think the retail investors, they're, they're here to stay? You know, the retail investors have been something we've been watching extremely closely. They, they were not nearly, you know, as strong earlier in the crisis. But if you look at mutual fund data and particularly you look at ETF flow data, you know, it's been it's been quite notable to see the amount of uh, retail interest, particularly in the U.S. I think it's also been interesting to see some of the trends within that data, for example, um, as we talked, as you were mentioning in an earlier uh, discussion, there, there are a lot of things that have changed in the mindset and that have changed generationally. ESG might have been thought as a millennial theme. Boomers are actually some of the biggest consumers of ESG ETFs right now. So I think retail is here. I think it should be reasonable to expect some skittishness because that's always how retail is. But it, it seems like solid footing. And John, what are your GPs focusing their energy on the most now on a spectrum of portfolio bailouts or sitting on the sidelines or is it time to actually seek new deals? Where do you sit right now? Well, I think a lot of the heavy lifting on the portfolio side has happened already and people are more focused on new opportunities right now, assuming that things don't get worse from here on the portfolio side. Uh, you know, th there's certain sectors that are benefiting and that are safer to invest in areas like IT and anything to do with digital and e-commerce, logistics, healthcare, uh, education. Uh, these are some of the broad themes that we're looking at and others are looking at. Um, but I, I think broadly speaking, uh, some of the kind of tactical opportunities in private equity right now are going to be around dislocation, say, in the public markets, where you may see a few take privates happening or deals in the public markets that involve structured type transactions where private equity firms step in to help recapitalize, say, banks or help recapitalize the balance sheets of companies that are looking to raise capital in this kind of an environment where there's more uncertainty. And John, you mentioned a little bit about some of your portfolio companies and maybe provide us some examples of, of how they're actually excelling right now and adapting to mm -hmm. not just a post-COVID world, but you know what they're seeing right now in the middle of this crisis. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, for example, we have some companies, we have a company in China that does cosmetics packaging and uh, they do, they're a global business, you know, 89, about 90% of their business, I would say, is historically been in the U.S. and in Europe and exporting to some of the larger cosmetic companies around the world, like L'Oreal, et cetera. And uh, what's happened is as, as, as China has reopened, the manufacturing operations are up to full capacity and operating at, at normal levels. But the overseas demand has fallen off uh, in Europe and the U.S. because of the, the delayed lockdown impact there. Instead, we're seeing a big pickup in domestic demand in, the, say, the cosmetic sector in China. So at the moment, about 35, 40 percent of our revenue is coming from domestic cosmetic companies in China, whereas previously that was only maybe 10 percent of our business. And overall, if you add it up, where, as I said earlier, about up, up maybe 5, 10 percent year on year on a combined basis, sort of pivoting the business to be more focused on where the demand is starting to emerge, which is really in Asia at the moment versus the US and Europe. And do you think that some of these changes you've seen, to what extent are they, are they fixed? Are these permanent things that could, could, that could stay? Well, some of them will be permanent. If, for example, the acceptance of digitalization and, and, and just the, remote, the whole remote working and remote purchasing patterns that we're starting to see. We have a company that's involved in testing, uh, delivering tests like the SAT test or the CFA test. And historically, those tests were done in testing centers for security reasons and just generally out of sort of custom. Uh, but we've been trying to institute an, a remote testing uh, program for, for years, and we've had a lot of resistance from customers. Now, in the midst of this, customers are really, really asking for it. And so we have been able to accelerate the rollout of that remote testing technology. And now about 40% of our business is being done remotely, which in the long run will, will help us to scale the business, improve our margins and, and, and provide a better service to customers. And I think that, that will probably be a permanent change that we'll see to that business 
through the customer acceptance, sort of the acceleration of customer acceptance of doing more business, more, more transactions remotely than, than was previously the case. Sheila, we have a viewer question now. Uh, are we in a giant asset bubble or on bubbles in certain sectors? Is e-commerce going to pop once shutdowns finish? What's your take on, on, on the site of bu bubbles right now? <laughs> Look, I think um, I think it's too early to call what's what's going on in any sense, a, you know, a bubble. Obviously, people get concerned about that, particularly when you see the levels of um, of government support, of central bank support. And as we look at it, we're much more focused on the long term. At the end, governments to resolve this crisis to help have taken on tremendous amounts of debt. When you think about that, there's sort of two ways to handle that: you pay the interest, or you inflate your way out of it over the long term. And I think inflation is raising its head on people's uh, radar from the long term, again, a several year perspective, and we see investors preparing for that. A little inflation is not necessarily a bad thing. It may take some time with un unemployment levels where they are. But, but I think some of the, the, the themes or the challenges in resolving uh, what's been done to, to aid during the crisis and then unwinding it is maybe what are the tides ahead that have to be looked out for more than more than a bubble per se? Mm -hmm. And John, yeah. you mentioned a little bit. I've got a couple of thoughts on the on the point, the valuation oh, question, because it's something that's yeah. also you know, an issue for us as we look around and look at prices and where they are today. It's interesting because you know, in, in a way, the markets are being very rational. It, normally, they're I would argue they're not always very rational, but in this case, they seem to be kind of rational because instead of res the knee jerk reaction of Earnings are going to decline, therefore stock prices should go down. I think that was more of a concern when people were worried about solvency and liquidity and whether we are really heading into some sort of a depression. But when that was taken off the table through the Fed action, then people started acting a bit more rationally, which is to say that the value of a business is really the current, the, the net present value, the discounted value of the, of the cash flows going into the future. And you could argue that what happens over the next six to 12 months does not really affect the long-term value of any business. And then the next part of that equation should be, you know, what is the discount rate? What, what is the interest rate that you're using to discount those future cash flows? And given the steps that have been taken by the central banks and also the likelihood of those interest rates staying down for maybe another one to two years or more, then the discount rate that's, that you would be applying today would be much, much lower, which is another way of saying that if you want to make any kind of a return on your money, the only place to put your money these days is into this equity markets or, or markets that have more equity value associated with them as opposed to fixed income or, uh, or cash or anything like that. So, so in some sense, it's really driven by where interest rates are and the fact that interest rates are so low and are likely to stay very low for a long time. And of course, uh, both of you guys were, were talking a little bit more about the recovery mm -hmm. in China as well. I, I'm just wondering, Sheila, ha has the COVID in any way delayed your expansion plans in China? You know, it, it really hasn't. I mean, obviously, we're working uh, towards, and we had Okay, I think we're having some technical issues uh, with, with Sheila right now. We'll try to establish her audio. Uh, John, I'll, I'll swing it back to you on, on the recovery in China. We've seen when it comes to PE investment involving foreign players, foreign investors, that's pretty much cut in half uh, in China right now, according to some reports that I've seen. Are foreign investors still quite cautious about investing in China? What's your take? Well, I think China, as a, from a macro standpoint, the economy is coming out of this first globally, and China is likely to be responsible for more than half global growth going forward. So there's certainly a lot of interest globally in investing in China. I think what you saw in the run-up to this was a, a bit of a bubble in the whole technology sector, in the venture sector, where company valuations got elevated. Uh, and I think now there's been a reality check. And that was not just driven by COVID-19. I think there was also some global reality checks and things like WeWork and other companies like that, where people took a step back and said, wait a second, these companies are not making money and they're unlikely to ever make money. You know, how should we be thinking about valuations? So there's been a few, a few factors at play in the earlier, early stage technology type of uh, investing in the market. But I would say that overall investor interest and private equity interest and venture capital interest in China remains high. The amount of digital transformation that's going on in the economy is pretty impressive. 
In fact, you could argue that the entire economy really should be thought of as a digital economy. And, and by and large, the, the, the division that people used to make between old economy and new economy, a lot of that is starting to blur because there, it's really embedded in just about every aspect of the economy now. So most businesses that we look at today, and we're more of a private equity investor, less of a, t of a venture investor, anything we look at today, we need to understand how technology disruption is affecting that business and also what the opportunities are with technology in that business in China specifically. All right, I think we got the technology issues resolved with Sheila. Uh, Sheila, you were saying expansion plans in China. <laughs> yeah, look, I think um, I think this this alone shows you we have we have a long way to go on our tech, but we're all getting better. I think um, you know from our perspective, China is a long term play for us, and we're not changing our plans. We've been engaged in our JV there and uh, continue to look to own that in full. Uh, for every part of the firm, so not just asset management. I think the U.S. and China relationship, notwithstanding, uh, both places are huge opportunities from a business perspective, and we'll continue to pursue that. There's been a report out there saying, Sheila, that Goldman has been in talks with Chinese partners, including ICBC, in some type of JV on the wealth management services business. What can you tell us at this point? Well, that might be a, that might be a purposeful technical yeah. default on her part. How convenient! All right. That was a convenient one. Come on with that. All right, got her back. Okay, Sheila, continue. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, you know, all I'll be saying is we're always in talks with, with, you know, a number of potential partners in every country. I think China for us is a big opportunity. We don't have anything new to announce yet, but you are reasonable to expect that we'll continue working with a number of partners. How, how do you differentiate yourself, though, Sheila? I mean, there's a lot of global asset managers that are just rushing to expand in China. So far, you've kind of focused funds on A shares, bonds not really generating a whole lot of returns, I guess, in, in general, it's not that exciting, I guess. How do you differentiate yourself in China? Well, look, I think, you know, one key thing that's different and that I expect will be very important in the years ahead is we're an active manager. And, you know, I agree with what was said earlier that we're in a period where it's tough and fixed income. It's tough uh, to be an index type player when you have set transformative changes going on in global economies. And I believe, you know, being an active right now, when we're about to, I think, go through a renaissance of active, whether it's public equities, private equities, et cetera, is going to be essential and a real value add uh, for our clients, because this is not an environment where um, just indexing works, frankly. You need to actively figure out what technologies and innovations and industries will be the ones of the future. And this is a yeah, question for both of you guys. Your point there about uh, about being more more bottom up and that the market beta, days of market beta lifting all boats. It's going to be a little harder, I think, going forward. At least in me, immediately post COVID, there's going to be a lot more granularity required in, in in where you invest and how you invest. And and being an active investor, whether it's on the public equity side, certainly in private equity, the model of being an active owner of assets and really driving value creation, I think, will start to to be more and more differentiated as public markets go through a period of, uh, of adjusting to the new realities. What, what about for both of you guys when it comes to headcount? Jean, are, are you hiring right now? We continue to hire. We've not, you know, we've not shrunk in our business. We've not had any, any, anybody letting, not let anyone go. We've, we are continuing to grow our business each year. We're not a huge organization, but, uh, but we continue to add people into our business uh, every year, and we plan to continue to do that. And Sheila, can you give us maybe specific targets for headcount, particularly in China? How does it stack up against Hong Kong and Singapore, for example? Look, I think at the moment, so we're still hiring, um, but I don't expect our footprint in the very short term as in the next you know, three to six months to change very much. Actually, one of the biggest things is just given the way our culture works and the strength of our culture, it's very hard to hire people via Zoom. 
And so for a lot of our, you know, key opportunities, as we think about things, we really want to meet people, bring them in our offices, uh, have them know us, not just in a, in a local office, but have them get to London, New York, et cetera, and really know entire teams because we run global teams. So we continue to hire selectively when we have processes already uh, in place. But for some of, you know, some of the newer things we might do, particularly in the Asia region, I think you may see it wait a little bit for a bit more of the recovery to ensue. And of course, we mentioned a little bit about China. We, we can't forget about Hong Kong as well. We've seen the US-China relationship being roiled by the Hong Kong situation right now. It's looking a little bit more cloudy. We, we just got a little bit more detail on this national security legislation. Sheila, I mean, just given just what you're seeing politically here in the city, how, how is Goldman planning their resource allocation near term? Look, I think um, we watch it with a fair bit of caution. It's been very challenging for our teams and we're most focused on our people. Um, it's been protests, then COVID, then protests again as people try to return to the workforce and return to the office. And I think nowhere have we seen more interest in getting back into the offices than Hong Kong, where people appreciate uh, the resources as well as the collegiality and camaraderie of the office. So we've been trying to work with them on really safe ways to get back. Um, I think from a markets perspective, you know, we and, and the clients we work with have been very concerned about the disruption uh, and particularly kind of the geopolitical situation that exists with the U.S. as we to some of the goings on in Hong Kong. And John, you, you talked a little bit more about having a, a pretty positive outlook on Hong Kong. We've just had these secondary listings, these Chinese companies returning and listing here in Hong Kong. We talked about uh, China easing rules on listings uh, for, with Charles Lee as well earlier. Is mm -hmm. this a good or bad thing? And what does that tell us about globalization now? I think Hong Kong's role as an international financial center will, is going to go from strength to strength. I think the, you know, the, the, the importance of Hong Kong as a capital raising center and a financial center, particularly for China, is only going to increase given the current geopolitical outlook that we see uh, in the U.S. And you, you're seeing already companies delist from the U.S. or, or have secondary listings here like JD.com, like, like NetEase and others that are planning to do the same. So I think that will continue. I think Hong Kong is likely to become much more integrated into Southern China with the Greater Bay Area project, which I think will create another impetus of sort of energy and growth for Hong Kong. So I remain positive on Hong Kong. We're headquartered here um, and you know we have every plan to continue to grow here and remain here. And when we talk about exits, uh how, you know, how are you seeing it right now? Do you expect any of your portfolio companies to, to exit in the next 12 months? Uh, the exit environment is difficult at the moment. Now, having said that, we've just had, in the last few months, we've, we've had three exits uh, of companies that were already listed. And we took the opportunity of, of markets being as buoyant as they have been to take some money off the table. But I think if you're talking about sort of a strategic sale at the moment, particularly a sale to another financial sponsor, one of the limitations is that most sponsor transactions are going to involve debt financing or leverage in the transaction. And the debt markets, uh, while they've come back uh, for investment grade credits, I think the overall sort of sponsor type financing is just starting to emerge. So uh, I would say that most companies that are people were intending to sell uh, pre COVID people probably want to wait to, to demonstrate the next six to nine months as being solid earnings period to, to then sell off those numbers together with a stronger financing market rather than sell into weakness right now. So I, I would expect the exit market to be a little bit subdued over the coming months. And, and Sheila, Jean mentioned about the Greater Bay Area. There, there's been this whole excitement over this Wealth Connect plan and, and the, the Hong Kong Funds Association, they're proposing that residents in the area can take part in, in some of these authorized funds in, in Hong Kong. What have you heard so far about this development? Does, does that shout opportunities for Goldman? Look, we're, we're very excited about it as well. And I think just in general, um, making funds easier to use for investors, particularly in the Greater Bay Area, uh, where 
customers really haven't had as many options and where the fund landscape has been more complicated, uh, we're very much in favor of that. I think that, you know, it always takes time to figure out whether a regime will actually be as easy to use as it sounds. So um, that's still a little bit to be seen, but overall, definitely a positive development and something we need in the region. All right, we have, a, I want to end on just one viewer question, which I thought was quite interesting. We do this quite a lot too. Um, the, for the retail investors watching, I'm going to ask both of you guys, if you have $10,000, where should you put it right now? John, I'll, I'll let you get the first word. $10,000, huh? I would say, <laughs> I, I would probably, being an Asian focused investor, I would say that Asian markets at the moment are relatively undervalued, particularly say Hong Kong market and the China market are relatively undervalued compared to say the S&P 500. So I would focus on this part of the world as being better value at the moment. Sheila, last word for you. <laughs> well, as usual, uh, ten, you know, $10,000, same question mark, depends a bit on where the rest of your money is, if you have it and what your time frame is and your age. But I would say, you know, it's a time to look at the long-term opportunity set in the equity markets. I think fixed income is extremely difficult. I think with that amount of money, a diversified set of um, equity fund holdings probably makes the most sense if it's an incremental investment.